And then Prabhupada spoke. And when he spoke, he said, the supreme absolute truth is a person. And I thought that was the most intelligent thing I'd ever heard in my whole life. You know, because I'd been reading all these Buddhist books, you know. Uh, you cannot say it is, you cannot say it is not. You cannot say it both is and is not. You cannot say it neither is nor is not. And here Prabhupada was telling me the supreme absolute truth is a person. And I thought that makes so much sense. And I, I really knew this time that I had found the person I was looking for. But I did begin to have a doubt a little later, because I... After you had joined? Well, I hadn't joined, no, this, this, right at this time. I began to think, well, I can see the Swami's very honest. He's not just here looking for money, but how do I know he really has knowledge? He could be very honest, also be misled. And I didn't say anything to him, but while I was thinking like this, I went to hear him speak, and he, said the, and he said, I teach only what is in Scripture. And then I thought, well, if he teaches only what is in Scripture, there's no danger. So I kept on going. That way I started going regularly. My first communication, I can at this point remember, took place during the mm, uh, Jamashtami time, mm, or Prabhupada's appearance uh, day. Uh, Srila Prabhupada would receive uh, roses from each one of us, which we offered him, and give a rose back. And he spoke. Uh, he gave a lecture. And uh, while he was lecturing, I felt like so many of my God brothers that Srila Prabhupada was not only speaking just for me, but he was uh, looking at me uh, so that I really felt personally addressed by Srila Prabhupada. It reminded me very much in some ways of Krishna's lunch with his uh, friends. Uh, he was there in the middle and he communicated to each one of the thousand cowherd boys. So in a similar way, I felt uh, what many of my God brothers have uh, told me, that Prabhupada just spoke to them and even uh, looked at them. Prabhupada's eyes were wonder, wandering over his audience and sometimes he closed his eyes in deep concentration but he somehow had the ability to connect to every one of us and I remarked that very much. Then finally because I felt so personally addressed by Srila Prabhupada I ventured to put mm, a challenging question to him. My intention was such, I wanted to test Prabhupada, foolish as I was, if he was really the perfect spiritual master I could surrender my life to, which would have serious consequences as far as money uh, was concerned <laughs> and position in life and so on. So the only way in my f uh, mind at that time, which was not very developed spiritually was, to ask him a challenging question which I felt he could not answer and then uh, see how he would react. And I asked a question to him which was mm, like this. If God is all good, why did he create this uh, maya which inflicts suffering upon the living entities? Prabhupada looked at me and then he requested Syama Sundara to repeat the question. Syama Sundara had not heard my question, maybe due to my mm, bad accent, and I repeated it again. Prabhupada asked again if the question could be repeated. I became insecure. But I again answered the question, you say God is all good, it can't be because he has created maya, which is certainly not all good with us. So either he is not all good, or maya has gone out of his hands and now uh, is no longer under his control and punishes 
us and makes us suffer uh, against the good intention of God? This was my question. Prabhupada looked very intently at me and then uh, spoke to me and said, not Krishna has created Maya, you have created Maya. I very much remember this. Uh, I was startled. I couldn't understand philosophically what he was saying. Me creating the whole material world? I cannot even create a house because I'm insolvent at the moment. Uh, um, um, later I could understand his explanation. Um, but at that time, all I could understand is Krishna was not at fault for my situation. I was at fault. And that was enough. I thought, what a brilliant answer. Uh, I have understood the point. Uh, I better surrender unto uh, 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 Krishna and Srila Prabhupada, who seemed to be very close with the Lord. That was the first uh, memorable encounter with Srila Prabhupada, where he uh, uh, had uh, demolished, uh, like a sadhu always does, my um, concept that I could challenge him and show that he was uh, not able to answer my foolish question and uh, where he had actually affected a transformation in my heart. Prabhupada, he would always talk about the impersonalists and the Buddhists and I agree, and I began to think, well, the Swami, he's not liberal enough. So we stopped going. It couldn't have been very long. We were at, you know, sitting around Mott Street talking about this. And suddenly, Kirtanananda came in. And he said, I've decided to leave the Swami. I don't like what's going on. So I said, well, we've been talking about that too. And he said, you fools, do you think I could leave the Swami? So we had been tricked. So uh, he insisted that we go see Prabhupada and talk to Prabhupada. So we went to see Prabhupada and Prabhupada said, that you should not think that uh, you cannot discuss things with me if you have some doubt. And I said, well, we don't like these things you're saying about the Buddhists and Sri Ramakrishna. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, okay, I will explain. He said, I have never criticized Lord Buddha. In fact, I have always called him Lord Buddha. But his followers eat meat, and they don't believe in God, and they don't believe in the soul. They are atheists. He said, you show me anywhere in the Buddhist scriptures where it talks about God or talks about the soul. He said, and as for Ramakrishna, I have always said, and I will always say, that he was nothing but a crazy priest. And he said, uh, he said Ramakrishna said that you could worship Kali or worship Krishna, and it's the same. And I do remember that reading his books. And he said, but Krishna says, if you worship the demigods, you go to the demigods. And if you worship me, you come to me. So he contradicted Krishna. He said, that's like say, buying a ticket to Chicago and trying to get to Los Angeles. You know? And I said, well, what about all these wonderful things in his books? Prabhupada said his disciples took them from the Vedas and put them in the books and said that he said them. And then he said, uh, Ramakrishna's followers eat meat. He said, they go to the doctor and get a letter saying they'll die if they don't eat meat, right? And he said, everybody, all the sadhus in India know this. And he told me about some gathering of sadhus. Maybe it was Kumbh Mela, I don't know, because in those days I knew nothing. And he said, uh, there was a dead fish floating on the water. And the sadhus were laughing. They were saying, quick, call the Ramakrishna mission. <laughs> and then here was the clincher. He told me when Vivekananda, Ramakrishna's principal disciple, when he met Ramakrishna, then Ramakrishna touched him on the forehead and Vivekananda felt electric shocks. And then Prabhupada started to laugh and he said, you've read about the universal form, where does it say anything about electric shocks? And then Vivekananda fainted. And when Vivekananda woke up, then Ramakrishna was crying. And Vivekananda said, why are you crying? And Ramakrishna said, I have given you all my power, I have none left. I, I remember that story. And Prabhupada said, so is spiritual knowledge like money? If I give it to you, I have none left. And that was the clincher. <laughs> the first time that I actually got to physically see Srila Prabhupada, 
was in Los Angeles in 1969. And I had been picking lemons to get money to go to a Zen Buddhist monastery to be a monk outside Santa Barbara, California. And I saw a poster about coming to see a real spiritual master. So I went to the Santa Barbara temple. It was a very small temple right by the ocean. There was no one there, but by Srila Prabhupada's mercy, as soon as I walked in the temple, I immediately knew that this is what I had been searching for and praying for for a long, long time. So I got a ride to go see Srila Prabhupada in Los Angeles temple. It was on a Sunday. And there was an initiation going on. And what stands out in my recollection of Srila Prabhupada, that it was certainly a somber and grave occasion and Srila Prabhupada was displaying that. But yet also I could see there was just so much love and compassion that was emanating from Srila Prabhupada when he was initiating people. And you could see this spiritual bond forming and immediately I thought, well, I want this. <laughs> and I remember Srila Prabhupada, one person who would come up to get their beads, and Srila Prabhupada asked them to repeat the four regulated principles, as he always does. And as they said, no intoxication, Srila Prabhupada laughed, and he said, and this means no more LSD? <laughs> and of course, I could also relate to that at the time, though I'd given up drugs. So that really struck me about Srila Prabhupada that at that time that there was, there was such an intimate mood of spiritual love that was being reciprocated in Srila Prabhupada. You could see he was like a universal father sitting on, on the Vyasa san. So that was my first physical contact with Srila Prabhupada. So uh, some guest asked Prabhupada one night, some guest said, well, what about LSD? This gives you spiritual visions. So I could see right away it was a trap. He was trying to trap Prabhupada. Because the Prabhupada would say, I never took it. He could say, how do you know? Then the and the Prabhupada would say, well, I tried it. It doesn't work. He'd say, well, you say no intoxication, but you take intoxication. So I went and said, well, I wonder how he's going to answer this. And Prabhupada said, I myself have never taken these things, but my disciples have all given them up. So, so that, that uh, took care of that. This was in the Los Angeles temple. He was seen um, during a very ecstatic kirtan laughing. And after the kirtan was over, the devotees asked why he had been laughing. And Prabhupada said, oh, he was laughing at Narada Muni. And the devotee said, oh, Narada Muni? Yes, Narada Muni was there. Oh, what was Narada Muni doing? He said, he was laughing. And they said, why was he laughing? He was laughing at all the mlechas and chandalas dancing and chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, as it is, he was still working on it. So we would read the Bhagavad Gita by Dr. Uh, Radha Krishnan, who was former president of India, and Swami Nikilananda, who was in disciplic succession from Ramakrishna. And Prabhupada would always say that Dr. Radha Krishnan was an impersonalist. But we didn't know what was an impersonalist. We didn't really know. And then one morning, Prabhupada said, Today I will show you that Dr. Radhakrishnan is an impersonalist. And he had Roy read uh, chapter 9, verse 34, Always think of me, become my devotee. And he said, Now read the commentary. And Roy read, When Krishna says unto me, It is not to Krishna whom we should surrender, but to the unborn eternal within Krishna. And Prabhupada said, You see, that proves that he's an impersonalist. Nobody understood. You know, sounded okay to, to me, sounded okay to everybody else except Prabhupada. And suddenly Kirtananda started to speak. Kirtananda said, he's right. And he went on this long speech about how it's really the unborn eternal within Krishna. And while he was talking, Prabhupada started to turn red. And I mean, really red. I, I was thinking, this is the first time in my life I understand what it means when they say somebody turned red. I had never seen anybody turn so red. And Prabhupada just sat there getting redder and redder as Kirtan Ananda spoke. And then suddenly Kirtan Ananda stopped and Prabhupada said, are you finished? And he said, no. And he went out and started again. You know? And then finally he stopped and Prabhupada said, are you finished? And he said, yes. And Prabhupada asked him a question, but I don't remember the question. And then suddenly Prabhupada stood up and he slammed his hand down real hard. And he said, 
then why do you want to take it away from Krishna? It's Krishna, it's Krishna, it's no one born within Krishna, it's Krishna, it's Krishna. And I looked and I had never seen anything so magnificent. I thought he is roaring like a lion. He was just like a lion roaring, you know. I could just almost feel the room shake. I, I thought it was just, it was so magnificent. I wish I could describe it to see that, you know. And then we understood. Mm -hmm. So Pra Prabhupada saved us on that day. Srila Prabhupada, uh, of course, you know, Prabhupada was naming everyone and explaining the name. And then I came last and he said, Lenny? And then Srila Prabhupada started laughing. And he said, oh, you have such a nice name. And then he said, your name is Narada Muni. And in those days, in the early days, Narada Muni was, I think, more prominent than he is now. Because he was a transcendental spaceman, and I think we were so spaced out that everyone related with Narada Muni. So he was very popular amongst the devotees, and everyone really was waiting, who's going to get the name Narada Muni? No one had gotten that name yet. And Srila Prabhupada also found it humorous, probably, that he gave that name to me. But when he gave, said Narada Muni, everybody was ooing and aahing and laughing. And Srila Prabhupada was laughing. This, is, this, this tape is there. It's the Ten Offenses tape. Srila Prabhupada so nicely explains the Ten Offenses. And he says some very profound things about initiation, too. He explains, you know, the offense of thinking that chanting Hare Krishna is like mundane religion. And Srila Prabhupada explains how you can get material benefit by mundane religion. But Krishna consciousness is beyond all religion. And Srila Prabhupada said, it's like from this ceremony, you can go back to Godhead. So that's the importance of getting connected with Srila Prabhupada. And then Srila Prabhupada said, after he gave me my name, and he laughed, and he said, so Narada Muni travels all throughout space. He said, so you should do like this. And with chanting Hare Krishna and your Veena, you can do. <laughs> now that's on tape. <laughs> I don't know what Srila Prabhupada meant. But <laughs> so Srila Prabhupada always had such a, a transcendental vision of all of us, you know, seeing something that we can't see in ourselves. And that's what's so beautiful about Srila Prabhupada. He could bring that out in all of us, you know, our spiritual essence. So there was some talk about an initiation and uh, some of the guys were already bowing, but I didn't bow. I remember Hari Guru said to me, I don't like this bowing. I said, me neither, you know, it was too foreign, you know. So uh, Prabhupada, we, we, so Roy came up to me and he said, well, I said, hey, Wally, you want to get initiated? And I said, well, I don't know if I'm ready for that. And he said, well, none of us are, but we're going to do it anyway. So, okay, me too. So he put my name down on the list. And uh, we asked Prabhupada, what, uh, what is initiation? And uh, Prabhupada said, I'll tell you later. So the day before the initiation, <clears throat> he, after, after the morning class, he said, now I will tell you what initiation means. Initiation means that the, disciple, that the spiritual master accepts the disciple and agrees to take charge of his welfare. And the disciple accepts the spiritual master and agrees to worship him as God. And he got up and walked out of the room. And we just sat there looking at each other. You know, I, I remember thinking, if the hydrogen bomb had just gone off in this room, we could not be more stunned, you know. To worship him as God, that was just inconceivable, and especially what Prabhupada said about people who want to be God, you know. And then uh, a Janaki, uh, who was Mother Jan, then it was, uh, it was uh, uh, Makunda Maharaja's wife at the time, he had her string the beads, right? He said, he said, women are good at this kind of work, you know. Uh, and um, he said, they have the patience to do it. So then uh, we all had our uh, beads, and we came up there for the initiation, and we tied the neck beads on. And I said, well, how do you get these off? And somebody said, you don't, right? And then uh, Prabhupada would pick up the beads one by one and say, whose are these? So when he picked up my beads... <clears throat> I said, those are mine, and he motioned for me to come, and he motioned for me to bow down, and I couldn't get away from it anymore, so I had to bow down. And then I repeated what he said. I, I assume I offered obeisances. I don't know. I just repeated what he said. 
And then he gave me my beads and he said my name was Umapati. And I understood it as meaning the husband of the goddess of fortune. So for a while I thought it was a name for Vishnu. But that must not be what he actually said because it's a name for Lord Shiva. And then I remember I went and I sat back, sat next to High Reva and I said, getting your beads is great because he hadn't gotten his yet. And then Prabhupada had us all touch our beads to the feet of Lord Chaitanya on the Panchatattva picture. And then he started the fire. And as the fire, you know, as pouring ghee on the fire, the room was filled with smoke. It was pouring out the windows. And I was thinking, any second the fire department's going to come and they're not going to believe what they see here. <laughs> and I run out later, everybody in the room had the same thought, you know. And then we all went home and left Prabhupada to clean it up. <laughs> I don't think... Anybody even thought of, of cleaning it up, you know. The second very moving encounter with Srila Prabhupada was indirect. I was uh, at that time having the service to wash uh, Lord Nashishi uh, Radha uh, London Ishwara's um, Maha plates. Uh, you must know that at that time, Shila, when we all took our morning breakfast prasadam, Srila Prabhupada in uh, the temple was empty. Srila Prabhupada went downstairs and stood for quite a lengthy time before the deities and prayed to them alone without anyone being there. Um, he would take his darshan and pray and then go back into his room. Uh, I had the service in the morning to wash the deity dishes and because so many thoughts were going on in my mind, now I have decided to surrender, what will be the consequences? Um, my girlfriend to whom I was promised in marriage had come to uh, convince me to take up my old ways. Uh, my grandfather was dying at that time and requested me to come to his deathbed where he would ask me to give up Krishna consciousness. And uh, I was in turmoil because in our family it, uh, you had to agree to the wish of a dying man. But I could not agree to give up what I thought is finally the, the grace of the Lord on me. So I stayed in the temple and I was in turmoil for various reasons, and I did not do a good uh, job in cleaning the uh, maha uh, uh, plates. One morning, as I was there washing the maha plates, being totally on the mental platform, um, the temple president came into the mm, kitchen. His head was red, and he stammered. He said, Prabhupada, uh, uh, he had darshan, and he uh, uh, said that Krishna told him that the plates are not uh, 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 nicely cleansed. There is still the old uh, 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 offering sticking to the plates. And he really said, uh, whoever wishes the dishes has to do a good job from now onwards. This really woke me up from my dreaming. I was responsible. I had uh, pondered over uh, uh, deeply mm, important issues at that time, but had not performed my service accurately and nicely. <laughs> and uh, Krishna had complained to Srila Prabhupada. There was no other way than Krishna telling Prabhupada, because you know when you have a dirty plate and you put um, the offering, maybe because it has to go so hurriedly on the altar, uh, then the old uh, remnants are covered with the new offering. So uh, the only way a person who can detect this is either the cook, but he was too fast, uh, or uh, uh, the one who eats uh, everything. <laughs> and uh, uh, this... Uh, personality, Lord Krishna had told Srila Prabhupada. So I was very much moved. It was a very, uh, I was very happy to hear this, that uh, there is a direct connection between Srila Prabhupada and Lord Krishna and became very 
inspired to surrender mm, uh, my life to Srila Prabhupada. Mm. Now one day Prabhupada said in the morning, he said, you should all chant 64 rounds a day. We said, what? 64 rounds a day? No, we can't. We, uh, and Prabhupada said, all right, 32 rounds. He said, oh, 32 rounds. No. Prabhupada said, all right, 16 rounds, no less. And that's how we started chanting 16 rounds a day. Now another time, and here's a time when Prabhupada smashed me, that I would sometimes type for Prabhupada, and if there were some English mistakes, I would correct the English mistakes. So I was typing a letter to someone in India, and it says, Sri Sri Radha Krishna. But I, I, I've heard of Sri, but I'd never heard of Sri Sri. Not only that, but one Sri was at the end of a line, and the next Sri was at the beginning of a line, and that's a common typing mistake, to type at the beginning of what you just typed on the last line. So I went into Prabhupada's room, and I said, Sri Sri, and Prabhupada said, yes. And I said, oh, I thought it was a mistake. And Prabhupada said, when I type in your language, you can correct me, but when I type in my language, you cannot correct me. And then somebody walked in, and Prabhupada said, I told him that when I type in his language, he can correct me. Now he wants to correct me when I type in my language. <laughs> About Srila Prabhupada's humble disposition, in spite of being the world Acharya, was displayed through one incidence. It was in Holland. Srila Prabhupada went to Amsterdam. He was about to give initiation. Devotees were new and un, not trained properly, so they didn't know how to organize things. And they were making mistakes at every step. And Prabhupada was getting more and more annoyed. And then finally Prabhupada, when he came to the temple room, or whatever it was, the room where, <laughs> which was where they used to get together, there was not a temple there at that time. <laughs> Prabhupada saw the, the altar for the sacrifice and he was very disappointed that it was not arranged properly. And he mentioned uh, that there was no fruit on the altar. And so one devotee, he ran downstairs to the kitchen and he cut some fruits and brought it up. And he gave the fruit to Srila Prabhupada, and Prabhupada got even more upset. So those days, one hippie kind of a person used to come to the temple quite regularly. And he used to notice that whenever someone would lose his cool, the devotees would tell him, why don't you chant Hare Krishna? <laughs> So when he saw that Prabhupada was getting agitated, so he told Prabhupada, why don't you chant Hare Krishna? <laughs> <laughs> and Prabhupada quietly took his bead bag and started to chant. Another time when uh, Prabhupada smashed me, of course, I had a background in professional recording, and I knew some big stars at this, so I was a little proud of this. And Prabhupada had this tape recorder. It was a, a Roberts brand. It was, at that time, considered the best of the uh, uh, amateur tape recorders. But, of course, in those days, there wasn't these nice little printed circuit things and these little tape cassettes. That technology was not popular yet. So machines were fixable. And I had experience fixing recorders, but I had experience fixing professional recording studios, a multi-thousand dollar. So I wasn't so familiar with his machine. So Prabhupada said, it's broken. I said, well, maybe I can fix it. So I went and I looked at it and I said, well, what does this do? And Prabhupada said, you cannot fix it. 
you have to ask me, what does this do? How can you fix it? And somebody walked in the room and Prabhupada said, he wants to fix my tape recorder, but he has to ask me, what does this do? He cannot fix it. <laughs> I was just burning with humiliation. <laughs> In early 1970, I was living in Washington, D.C., and distributing Back to Godheads on a college campus. It may have been Kent State, you know, that's in Ohio, isn't it? It was around that time when Kent State happened and there was so much unrest on the campuses and National Guard shooting at students, a very, very tense atmosphere. And we were there trying to d distribute back to Godheads and give out incense. That was pretty much the extent of our book distribution back to Godheads. Back then you'd get a quarter, you know, sell a few, and that was a big deal <laughs> back then, you know. And um, all the students were so agitated, no one would take a magazine, and I remember I was being really upset, you know, I could, I was getting really upset, and then a, a, a newspaper reporter came up to me and asked if he inter could interview me, and I said, oh, sure, you know, and I sat and talked to him about Krishna consciousness, and I made this comment, um, he wanted to know what I was doing before I joined this organization and I told him a little bit about you know, living on the hippie farm and I said I became discouraged with that um, philosophy. I said we were being misled by false rascals like Timothy Leary, I said to this reporter. You know, because actually I had studied some of Timothy Leary, Leary's books and I felt betrayed because I realized they were simply saying, take drugs and have great sex. And, and I wanted knowledge of the absolute truth, and I knew that was, you know, material. It had to do with the physical body. What does that have to do with spiritual knowledge, you know? And I became very disillusioned when I actually read one of his books and realized that was the conclusion. You know, take LSD and have great sex. So, so I said that to this reporter, you know. We were being misled by false rascals like Timothy, promising God in a pill, you know, just swallow this pill and see God, you know. And so they happened to, a lot, in those days, a lot of the articles that came out in newspapers, devotees were very badly misquoted, you know. They, they didn't understand what we were talking about, so they'd just, I think, go research a book in the library on Hinduism and write that, you know, some nonsense. But this happened to be one of the first articles where they actually quoted quite accurately, so they wrote my exact words in the paper. And I think maybe that's why this article had some particular potency, because they actually got it right, what we said. I mean, it was a very long article. A lot of other devotees said a lot of nice things, too. You know, they, So when they showed, but this part happened to be right at the front of the article, the thing I said. And, and actually, when they published the article in the Washington Post, a photographer came to the temple and took a picture of me for the article. And when it came out, it was on the front page of the the style section of the Washington Post was prestigious. The whole pa front page was this big picture of my face. <laughs> you know, I, was so, I mean, I'm extremely camerish. I was so embarrassed. But by Krishna's mercy, I'm not photogenic, usually. But by some quirk of Krishna's mercy, this was a really nice photograph. I mean, I actually looked nice in this photograph, you know, which is, you know, if I'd looked like normally like a gargoyle like I usually do, and it would have been horrible. But... And I had this big nose ring with a chain come into my ear, and, and they published that, you know, and with this article. And, um, and when they showed the article to Prabhupada, and he read my comments about Timothy Leary, you know, I said specifically, false rascal. And of course, I got that terminology from hearing Prabhupada, you know. He made a statement to the devotees that showed him the article. He said, George Harrison has given me $19,000 for printing the Krishna book. But this girl has given me $19,000 million by her statements. So, uh, you know, I was a very young devotee when I heard that. I can't tell you how much encouraging it was. You know, perhaps Prophet said it to encourage me, but, you know, he was so merciful. I just basically, I wasn't exactly parroting something I'd heard from him, because I did have that realization, but it was definitely Prabhupada's inspiration that made me say that. You know, so I think that's a lot of the way Prabhupada interacted. He would inspire us, and then if we would were surrendered to the the inspiration, it would be this like reciprocal exchange between the guru and disciple that was extremely esoteric and difficult to explain. But I think most of us have, you know, understand it's it's an experience that one has. After a certain time, this was after I was initiated, 
then I blooped. I was the second bloop in the movement, right? I, my distinction was I was one of the first people to cause Prabhupada great pain and suffering, right? But the devotees would have to come and get me because Prabhupada's uh, electronic equipment was always breaking down and I was the only one who knew how to fix it. So they would have to come and get me. So I remember one time they got me, something was broken. And I was, in, I was talking to Kirtan Ananda, and I think this was when I had my first Golubjaman. I don't remember if this was the first time I saw Jagannath Baladev and Supadra. Anyway, Kirtan Ananda and I were talking, and Prabhupada came into the room, and he walked right up to me, and he said, even if you don't want to be one of us, you must associate with us. You cannot get away from us. <laughs> so Prabhupada was always very concerned. I'll tell you a story how concerned Prabhupada was. There was a boy who turned up that I didn't know. He started coming again. But some of the boys who had been with Prabhupada earlier knew him. Uh, and um, he seemed like just an ordinary guy, you know, somebody from the Lower East Side. But Prabhupada seemed to know him. And Prabhupada, I saw Prabhupada talking with one of the other guys, and Prabhupada said, oh, he's making advancement, don't you think? And Prabhupada was very eager that he should make advancement. And I found out later that this was the young man who had attacked Prabhupada with a knife. You know, and Prabhupada had to go next door to Makunda's apartment for shelter. But Prabhupada's only thought was, oh, oh, don't you think he's making advancement? That's all he cared about. Once in a morning walk, <clears throat> Prabhupada was, this, this was in America, Prabhupada was discussing the Apichet Sudarat Chipto Bajate Mama Nanyabak, that verse. That if one is rightly situated in devotional service, even if he falls down and commits even a heinous uh, fall down, he's still considered saintly if he's rightly situated and carries on his devotional service. So Prabhupada was speaking about that. And then one devotee uh, raised the point, Srila Prabhupada, you're saying that if it's an accidental fall down, then Krishna considers him saintly. But if it's premeditated, then that's a different situation. Then we're sinning in knowledge. So how do we know if the fall down is accidental? So Prabhupada, he was walking and he stopped for uh, about 30 seconds. And then he said, if he comes back, it was accidental. That was his answer. And how I understood it was that if someone bloops and is gone and comes back 10, 15, 20 years later, if he comes back and takes up devotional service again, then Prabhupada will consider it was an accidental fall down. And to me, that just showed the ocean of compassion that Srila Prabhupada was. He had so much mercy, so much compassion, that someone would fall down, fall away completely. But if he would come back, Prabhupada would consider that all those years in Maya was simply an accidental fall down. Such a compassion. So I mean, that, that really hit home. At that time, Timothy Leary was very big among the hippies, and uh, he was a big LSD king, and he had a place up in Millbrook, New York. And a few of us were sitting around this prashad room talking one day, and some young man came in that I didn't know, but some of the other devotees knew him, and he was giving us all the latest hippie gossip, so of course I was very interested, you know. And then he said, well, so-and-so just came back from Millbrook, and they had the wildest party up there. So immediately I was all ears. I want to hear about this wild party. And Prabhupada looked through the window and said, Umapati, you are not sitting properly. Because I had my back to the altar. So I had to turn around and face the altar. And I couldn't hear anything that was said. The whole thing was blocked. <laughs> Another evening I was reading to Srila Prabhupada the pastime of Pralam Basura with Lord Balaram. And Srila Prabhupada was really enjoying that. And then we got to the point where Pralam Basur was being pummeled by Lord Balaram. And Srila Prabhupada you know, be, began laughing and, and he exclaimed very boldly, he said, this is God. And then he told how when he was a child, he used to enact this pastime with his sister. And he said, and I would play Balaram. <laughs> and then he laughed and laughed about that. <laughs> so that was very sweet. Hayagriva and I were looking at the dust cover of the Srimad Bhagavatam that Prabhupada brought from India, you know, the material and spiritual world. And there's the big lotus and then there's all these bubbles. 
So we were looking at it, and there was one bubble we both liked. We said, wow, this is nice. Yeah, far out, man. Yeah, that's where I want to go. Yeah, boy, that really looks great, you know. So we said, yeah, we decided this is where we wanted to go. So he was on his way to the temple. I had something else to do. So I said, ask the Swami what that bubble is. Then that afternoon I came back. I said, did you ask the Swami what that bubble is? He said, yeah, he said it's a material world. <laughs> On a morning walk with Srila Prabhupada in Amsterdam, uh, where we passed many sleeping hippies, and Prabhupada had his comments about them. Finally, we arrived to a tree uh, which had a nest where there was a little bird who was just about to fly. Um, we all came around that nest. The bird was standing there and was a little doubtful, should he fly or should he not fly? We all were there and Prabhupada encouraged him and uh, finally the bird came down. Not very elegantly, he more or less tumbled, uh, but he had an idea how to hold his little wings. Uh, Prabhupada then turned around to us and said, how does the bird know how to fly? This was the cue for those who knew. Um, instinct Prabhupada, said one who wanted to res represent the modern scientists, and Prabhupada immediately felt arisen. That is just a name. They do not know. The Lord Paramatma is in the heart of the little bird and directing him to fly. So whatever Prabhupada saw, even a little bird who made his first flying excursion or flying attempt. Srila Prabhupada connected to Krishna and that uh, was very visible during the morning walks. Now another time I was in Prabhupada's room typing and Prabhupada was doing something so we weren't speaking and it was a cloudy day. It was all gray and suddenly the sun came out and suddenly the room was filled with light and Prabhupada said, when the spiritual sun comes out, it is like that. And we got to the, um, the Juhu Beach, which was a beautiful white sand beach, where Prabhupada liked to take his morning walk. And we're walking along, and she, Prabhupada is looking out at the ocean. He said, he said what, is that, what is that water? What is that ocean? You know, what is that water? And... Nobody said anything for a while. And I remember the first thought that popped in my head was, oh, it's Krishna's energy, but I was too shy to say anything, you know, so I didn't speak. Nobody spoke. Finally, somebody spoke up. Actually, it was my husband. <laughs> he said, oh, Prabhupada, it's the Arabian Sea. And again, I don't know if he told this story. <laughs> He's probably embarrassed. Again. Prabhupada, it's the Arabian Sea. And so, again, Prabhupada was, was already angry from the incident at the door, and he again lightning bolt shot out of his eye you think your spiritual master is so nonsense he doesn't know that's the arabian sea <laughs> you think i don't know that's the arabian sea you know that obviously wasn't the answer he was looking for and so then satsa rupa popped oh it's krishna's energy yes you know and he gave the example of how the um, ocean waves just come up instead of inundating the whole land and flooding everything they just come up you know, to a certain, how that's Krishna's arrangement, you know, how nature works under the laws of, you know, that Krishna establishes. And so that was the one morning walk I went on. It was very, very <laughs> instructive. When Srila Prabhupada chastised, again, it was that experience where you felt bad, but it wasn't like the low self-esteem. You felt cleansed. You didn't feel bad. You felt like you learned a valuable lesson. You felt cleansed. Nothing with Srila Prabhupada ever made you feel bad about yourself or it was all growth and encouragement whether he chastised or praised sometimes he could chastise you i mean when Prabhupada would yell at you your life air would leave your body there was one time in Vrindavan in 76 or 77 i stayed over that winter and i would i was dressing this small radha krishna deities and then as soon as that was done, I would go and prepare the Vyasa-san for Srila Prabhupada's Guru Puja. 
So I didn't know at the time. Nobody ever told me that that you shouldn't be bare, completely bare chested. I'm not, all these devotees. Nobody ever told me. I thought this is what you were supposed to do. So one day I was getting the altar ready, and I was going to do the the arti that day. And Prabhupada came, and he came, and he said to me, "You should have something around your shoulders." So somebody gave me something. So I thought, well, this is because I'm going to do the arti. I got to wear something. So I did the arti. But the next day, I wasn't going to do the arti, so I didn't bother putting anything on. And when Prabhupada came in, he said, I told you, you should always have a wrapper. You should listen and learn. And uh, it took me days to recover from that. When Prabhupada would do that to you, your life ever would leave your body. You know? It took me a long time to recover, to get my composure back. But still, I see this now as being very mild. You know, I see this as being very mild and compassionate. You know, I was in Mayapur in 1976, and in those days there was just two buildings. There was the temple building, and then what we called the long building. Now they have names like Shanka, Padma, Gadda, and all these, but I, I still know them as the long building. So Prabhupada was going through a walk, for a walk around the grounds. And in those days, when I first came there, there were rooms along the boundary wall, and some of the devotees stayed there because the long building hadn't been finished. And as you came towards the Prashadam Hall, they had some toilets that was used by the, the Bengalis. So Prabhupada's on a walk, and all the senior devotees are there, Bhavananda and Jayapataka, and, and he comes up in this toilet Every time I passed that toilet, it was disgusting because there was stool everywhere. It was never clean. So Prabhupada sees this and he says, what is this? It's filthy. So then Bhavananda says, oh, this is not our toilet, Srila Prabhupada. This is the Bengali toilets they are using. So Prabhupada says, why is not clean? Why you are not cleaning? You're not cleaning because it does not disturb you. If you were in the mode of goodness, you could not tolerate this. And immediately you'd be clean. But you're in the mode of ignorance, and you're in harmony with this mode of ignorance, and that's why it stayed like this. So he immediately ordered it, cleaned up. <laughs> so, you know, he was explaining that, that if you're at the same guna, then you're in harmony with that guna. So if you're in the mode of ignorance, you come across something in the mode of ignorance, it doesn't disturb you, and it just stays like that. But if you're in the mode of goodness, then the mode of ignorance and passion, it disturbs you, and you, want to, you can't tolerate that, and so you want to bring it to a higher level. So he was chastising devotees that they were in the mode of ignorance because they didn't clean up the stool. <laughs> didn't disturb them, and they left it like that. Prabhupada's house in Vrindavan was a little different than it is now. Now there's a store when you go in, but there used to be just like a little entranceway, and then there was a double door that led into Prabhupada's living room. And Harikesh, uh, Harikesh Maharaj was Prabhupada's secretary, and he was sitting in a little vestibule, uh, typing, and I was there talking to him one day, and Palika came. So Hari Kesh told her, Palika, I want you to tell me everything that's going on. So she gave him all, you know, all the uh, things that were going on in Vrindavan that shouldn't be going on in Vrindavan, you know, this one and that one and this one and that one. And then she left, and, and um, Hari Kesh looked through the crack and between the two doors, and he saw Prabhupada walking away. He said, oh, no, he said, Prabhupada heard everything. And the next day, when Prabhupada gave class, he said, uh, if you have illicit sex in Vrindavan, you will take birth as a monkey in Vrindavan. So that is Krishna's mercy because you have taken shelter of Vrindavan. He said, but stop this monkey business. <laughs> so on this morning walk, um, there were these large gates, large, huge wooden doors at the entrance to the property that were closed at night. And um, it was after Mangal Arti. Srila Prabhupada was going on his morning walk. We were trailing along with him, and he came to the, the, the wooden gates, and they were closed. And Srila Prabhupada was livid. He was so angry. Why the gates are closed? He said, you think this Mangal Arti is just for you? No, it is for all of them. Why, you must keep these gates open so the villagers, the nearby villagers, can come to Mangalarti. Oh, he was very, very angry you know, that we were so self-centered and thoughtless. You know, that we, you think this Krishna consciousness, this Mangalarti is just for you? He was always teaching us 
to um, think of others, giving Krishna consciousness to others, you know. And that way we would save ourselves. By trying to save others, we would save ourselves. But this being, being so concerned just for our own advancement and to hell with everybody, that wasn't Prabhupada's way. Another time in Vrindavan, Prabhupada was complaining that they, he said, you're offering the deities rotten flowers. And the flowers looked okay to us. Prabhupada said, you know, if you offer the deities rotten flowers, they will not say anything, but your life will be spoiled. And he talked about this many, many times, you know. And then one time they gave Prabhupada a garland that was bigger than the garland on Krishna, and Prabhupada made them exchange. They said, you cannot give me a garland that is bigger than the garland on Krishna. In San Francisco, Rathiatra in the early days, uh, one Rathiatra that I was at, and I was helping to cook for that Rathiatra with Gohari Prabhu. And so after the Rathiatra, we went to the family dog auditorium where the activities were being held simultaneously there and on the beach. And that was very wonderful. There's a very famous quote of Srila Prabhupada, and I was fortunate enough to be there for that. Uh, there were literally hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands, it was a big auditorium, you know, hippies that were in the auditorium. Vishnu John Maharaj was leading the kirtan, just, you know, chant, chant, and when you're tired, take prasadam, and chant more and more and more, intense chanting, and, and everyone was, like, dressed in their full regalia. I mean, it was an incredible scene. Everybody was, like, fully dressed in all kinds of different hippie things and dressed like Krishna and all kinds of things. And in the middle of all this, Srila Prabhupada came walking through the whole crowd, you know, just like a swan, you know, untouched by the material energy and anything that's going around him. And Prabhupada walked through, and he went up to the stage, and he spoke, and he declared, I have come to make the hippies happies. <laughs> and it was just the perfect thing to say. Only Srila Prabhupada could say something so profound, you know. And so that was very wonderful. Another time I came to fix Prabhupada's equipment and when it was fixed, somebody put on a record of Ravi Shankar. And when the music came on, then Prabhupada started to smile. So somebody said, do you like this music, Swamiji? And he said, that is sense gratification music. And Hayagriva said, well, that's a raga. They play it in temples. Prabhupada said, that is sense gratification music. And he said, but, but it's Ravi Shankar, it, it, it's a raga, they play it in temples. And Prabhupada said, no, it is sense gratification. And Hayagriva kept insisting, no, it's a raga, you know. And then Prabhupada said, Ravi Shankar is a businessman. And then somebody said, well, what if he wants to be a devotee? Prabhupada said, oh, fine, let him come. And then somebody else said, but Swami, you were once a businessman. And Prabhupada said, because I went naked then, I should go naked now. And Hyde Reaver in the meantime was all fuming and you know, then he was, you know, kept arguing, but it's a raga. They, Hai, Prabhupada started laughing. Prabhupada and I were laughing at him. The problem was I was having trouble with my, an abusive marriage partner and it was like very severe and I wanted to commit suicide. And I told Srila Prabhupada that. I said, Srila Prabhupada, I can't be Krishna conscious. Um, I feel like I'm going to commit suicide. Um, I just kind of laid it out. I just kind of blurted it out. I didn't know what else to do, so I just, well, I bothered him. I better tell him, well, you know, why I bothered him. I just kind of blurted it out. And then, you know. Um, Srila Prabhupada said, um, you know, he paused. He's very thoughtful, you know, took me very seriously. Wasn't sentimental. Like I said, he was detached. You know, oh, not, oh, you poor little thing kind of thing, you know. Um, he looked me right in the eye, and, and I just, I was asking if I could live separately from my husband. I wasn't asking for a divorce or that I wanted to marry someone else, or, you know, I just needed to be free of the, the stress of that situation so I could remain in the movement and continue. And he said, he looked, he was kind of looking off, not quite looking, he was very thoughtful, and then he looked me, like his eyes opened wide, and he looked me right in the eye, and he said, there will not be other men. Oh, no, Srila Prabhupada. I mean, that was the last thing on my mind at the time. You know, I was so, I was really at the stage where the thought of 
man-female relationships did make me spit. You know, I mean, I was like that, but it was, it was mundane. You know, it was forced by a mundane. It wasn't like any kind of great spiritual realization. It was just so unbearably miserable. And um, he said, there will not be other men. Oh, no, Srila Prabhupada. He said, you will, you will stay in our temple? Yes, Srila Prabhupada. So those two things. It's not like he was going to sanction some divorce and remarriage. He wasn't going to go that far, you know. But he, he said... He said, all right, you may, you may stay here and assist Palika, you know, and, and that was kind of it, you know. And then when I went to see Prabhupada in Los Angeles with my then wife, and we were talking, at one point my wife said, Prabhupada, I'd really like to read your books. And Prabhupada said, you have a very nice wife. I said, you should take care of her. At a, another Rathiatra, you know, maybe it was 1971, I was manning a, a cart, a book cart, because at the time I was a, a book distributor, and we had a couple of carts, and we were selling books, and I, I just remembered, you know, at one point, asking someone just to man it for a minute, and I ran up to go see Srila Prabhupada on the cart before it took off, and, and you could feel Srila Prabhupada looked at me, you know, and everybody was probably feeling the same thing, but, you know, I know Srila Prabhupada looked at me, and he gave me some acknowledgement, and he smiled, and it made me feel so wonderful. And then after, I remember going to where he was staying in the apartment, and Srila Prabhupada was getting a massage, and we came in and we gave Srila Prabhupada the reports on how many books were sold, and we came in with these big bags of Lakshmi collected, <laughs> and Srila Prabhupada was, oh, very, very nice, thank you so much. So, you know, Srila Prabhupada had nothing to thank us for, we had everything to thank Srila Prabhupada for, but he was always thanking us. It's like I was mentioning that RT was saying, you know, I have no, no service to offer, so I just thank you for allowing me to, to serve my Guru Maharaj. Like that. This was just before uh, I left with, another, with a Canadian devotee, Hanuman, just, just before we left to go to Paris and open the temple. And uh, we went on a morning walk with Prabhupada. And at one point, Prabhupada said that he was talking about love, how love requires free will. He said, just like if you want somebody to love you, they must do it by their free will. He said, you cannot force somebody. You can't, and, he said, and, and he grabbed me by the shoulders. And he said, you cannot say, you must love me, you must love me, you must love me. And he was shaking me like that, you know. And Prabhupada was very strong. They were very, very powerful. Prabhupada did two pu public programs, as far as I remember. Um, uh, one, and on one program, my father confronted him. He was angry at Prabhupada for having stolen his sons. He said, I cannot believe that it is responsible to bring a foreign culture into, that is the Indian culture, into Germany. It will not survive. The people who are now with you will not be able to stay. It's almost like taking a crocodile from Egypt and transplanting it in the cold river Rhine. How will the crocodile survive there? It's irresponsible. Prabhupada took up the challenge. He looked at uh, my father. He must have understood it's the father of one of his disciples. And he said, you can become Krishna conscious in suit and tie. My father understood. He understood Krishna consciousness is not a matter of culture. The dress may change according to culture. But no, you didn't have to dress in an Indian way. You didn't have to accept the externals uh, to become Krishna conscious. And to this day, he remembers this. At the first moment, he was thinking, oh, this is too simple of an answer for my very intellectual uh, uh, challenge. But the words of the pure devotee do not necessarily act on the intellectual 
or mental platform on which the question was posed. They have a Shakti, a transformative Shakti, which uh, works much deeper. And uh, my father thought, what a pleasant encounter. The Germans are used to <laughs> tough discussions. And uh, he was uh, very much, uh, yes, he thought, my son is in good hands. This is a very sensible personality. <laughs> and uh, uh, I was very, very grateful to Srila Prabhupada for having solved a difficult family issue. They went in to meet Srila Prabhupada. Um, my mother took a picture. I have a photograph of my father sitting, Srila Prabhupada sitting on the floor behind his desk and my dad sitting cross-legged in front of and she, my, They're both looking at the camera and they're both smiling so effulgently, the same smile. And I call that picture my two fathers. It's like my father, my material father is reflecting the effulgent smile of my spiritual father. And so my parents thanked Srila Prabhupada for saving their daughter from drugs and hippie, degraded hippie life. And Srila Prabhupada smiled and said, yes, many parents thank me. <laughs> and then he said, they told him they were concerned about their daughter because I was in India and it, you know, it was hard to have communication. They didn't know what was happening. They were concerned about me. And Srila Prabhupada said, yes, I'm also concerned about my children. So, you know, he chatted with my parents on that level of parents. He knew how to relate to everybody. And then he gave my parents some prasadam from his plate. He was just, you know, showered them with mercy also. One time I was uh, blooped and I came there and we were talking and somebody said something about India. And I said, oh, I would like to go to India. And Prabhupada said, for what, sightseeing? I couldn't answer. I must say, in retrospect, the programs were poorly announced. Uh, our leader mm, had uh, made a big poster with Prabhupada's picture saying in big letters, Der Führer, in small letters of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, and in big letters, Kommt. So anyone would read, Der Führer kommt. The, uh, the, the Führer comes, reminding them of someone who is totally not possessed of holy <laughs> uh, qualities, of divine qualities. And soon on the posters, little mustaches appeared under Srila Prabhupada's nose. And uh, it was really one of the examples of how his disciples did not serve his preaching mission so well. May I ask, the lamp, lamp is blinking, does this mean? Uh, uh, There's two and a half minutes left yeah, on this tape. Good. Uh, so, uh, Srila Prabhupada had a few hostile elements in the audience and I really believe it was in part due to the very unintelligent advertisement of the public programs. Um, so one man was particularly disturbed, and he said, the chanting, it is mass hypnosis, maybe remembering Hitler's speeches where he would uh, influence with his very passionate talks many people. This is hypnosis. Prabhupada looked at him and very kindly said, it is not hypnosis. It is not self-hypnosis, he said. It is self-purification. And he very nicely knew how to, I mean, he was so expert to, with a few sentences, address his audience. It's very interesting because I left again. I mean, my record, my history is not so great. And... Um, when I was living in San Francisco as a householder, then I learned how to program computers. This is in the before windows. Uh, and Spiritual Sky Factory, the old incense factory in L.A., and I didn't know about this, but Dianonda later told me they wanted to know if they should buy a computer. And Prabhupada said, yes, get a computer and Umapati can run it. And I had, I had not communicated with Prabhupada anything that I was, you know. 
So when I did come down to Los Angeles and get back into the swing of things again, I started programming the computer. And um, on the morning walk one day on the beach, Prabhupada said to me, can your computer tell how many grains of sand there are on the beach? And I said, no, Prabhupada, you would have to tell the computer. The computer, you know. Uh, and then Srupa Damodar said, does that mean there is a brain superior to the computer? And I said, the computer is not a brain, it's just a stupid machine. And the prophet seemed satisfied with that answer. <laughs> he didn't say any more. I remember uh, in New Vrindavan, one time we were having a darshan with Srila Prabhupada in the house he was staying. And some letters had just come in from different parts of the world glorifying Srila Prabhupada for, you know, his books and, you know, coming in from different educators and scholars. And there was this one letter in particular that Srila Prabhupada really liked and, and he had somebody read it. And this letter, I don't remember who it was from, but it was from a big, big man, you know, big, big scholar. Uh, I think it maybe it was someone in, you know, in one of the big mots uh, down, you know, in South India. I'm not, not sure. I think maybe it was the Madhva Mat and uh, the Acharya of that Mat. And they was reading it, and this, this Acharya was saying how these books that Srila Prabhupada has written, how they could not possibly be, lit, be written. You know, they're so profound, and, and Srila Prabhupada's so prolific. How someone could do this, being an ordinary soul, is not possible. And this person said, it is my belief that Srila Prabhupada is Vyasadeva himself. <laughs> and Srila Prabhupada just lit up with a big smile and everyone, Jai Prabhupada, Jai Srila Prabhupada. So, you know, we really don't know. We really don't know who Srila Prabhupada is. And what he accomplished, no one even came near accomplishing previously. And it's unlikely that for a long time, anyone will. Srila Prabhupada was directly, as we know, sent by Krishna. And he came to the most you know, fallen place. And only Srila Prabhupada was empowered with that direct potency of Krishna. I mean, Prabhupada once said, Krishna asked him to come to the material world. Said, will you come? Will you go, please, and, and deliver them? You know? So Srila Prabhupada, though he didn't want to leave, of course he came out of his great compassion. And we saw that. Prabhupada was in Vrindavan. He didn't want to leave. But, but he came. He came. At the first, the first Mayapur festival in 1972, when the cornerstone laying ceremony occurred, it was just around the time when devotees were starting to, to learn some of the Indian styles of chanting, particularly the Bengali styles of chanting, which was, was quite different. Srila Prabhupada's way that he taught us to chant was very distinct. Um, in my view, completely transcendental, not of this world, and very, very different from the um, ben so-called Bengali style of chanting, which, which is like, like folk music you know, like traditional folk music, melodies and styles passed down. It's, it's like a form of entertainment or music. Um, when the devotees started imbibing that change, you know, from, from simply absorbing Srila Prabhupada's example and trying to emulate it in our chanting to adopting some of these Indian styles and techniques and different drum beats than the one Prabhupada taught us. And he expressed some displeasure with that at the beginning when it started. Um, and especially at the beginning when the devotees weren't very good at it. There was one devotee, his name was Achyutananda Maharaj. He'd been in India for some time and had learned some of these things, I believe, mostly from some of Prabhupada's godbrothers in Gaudiya Math and maybe some other places, I'm not sure. But... Um, he started teaching this to the other devotees, you know. In fact, he was quite, I hesitate to use the word puffed up, but he was a little bit arrogant about it. Oh, you don't know how to chant. I'll teach you how you should be chanting. You know, here in India, you have to do it this way. And 
you know, and some devotees kind of fell for it because it was catchy and the drum beats were catchy and catchy tunes and, you know, it led the... But Srila Prabhupada, at the beginning, the devotees weren't very good at it, so, so the result was, was kind of a cacophony of a very unpleasant sound vibration rather than, than the beautiful angelic chanting that, that we used to do under Prabhupada's tutelage, it became just a mess, you know, and Prabhupada would hear that going on sometimes from his grass house and he would say, it is a pinching sound, you know, he'd make a face, it is a pinching sound and he would close his window so he didn't have to hear it when the kirtan was over, he would say, thank goodness it's over. So in 1976, for the festival in Mayapur, all the devotees came first to Calcutta. And we were sitting out in the balcony at 3 Albert Road, taking breakfast prasadam. And we noticed there's three musicians walking along. One had a harmonium strapped over his shoulder, another one had a madanga, and the third one had kartals. They were just walking along. But they looked up and saw all the Western devotees there, so they stopped and started chanting Hare Krishna. I thought it was pretty attractive. Some devotees liked it, but others uh, were complaining and thinking that this is not proper. They're just singing for money. They're professionals, and you know they didn't like it at all. Then all of a sudden, someone comes out of Prabhupada's room. Prabhupada was there, walks downstairs, and walks over to these musicians and gives them a rupee. So they, they smile, they thank, thank him, and he leaves, and they stop, and they go. So then there was a, that was a big controversy. All the devotees were saying, what, what happened? Why they gave money, Krishna's money, to these professional musicians? So they asked the devotee why he did that. He said, well, Prabhupada gave me a rupee. He told me to give it to them. Why did he do that? I don't know. So they, he, you know, they asked him to please find out. So he went in and asked Sri Prabhupada. He said, Sri Prabhupada, the devotees are wondering why we gave Krishna's money to these professional musicians. And Sri Prabhupada said, We've enjoyed their music, therefore we are indebted to them. We give a rupee, clear the debt. And when I told this story to one uh, Indian Mataji devotee, she said, ah, yes, my mother always taught us that. <laughs> and thereafter, whenever I was traveling in India, you travel in the trains, a lot of times singers come by and everything, so I would always pull out a rupee and pay them because you know, I didn't want to be indebted because I enjoyed the music. But if someone came by who didn't have any talent, I wouldn't give them anything. <laughs> I didn't feel indebted because I didn't enjoy it. They were just bothering me. When he got to England, I spent a week in England and it never stopped drizzling. I saw the sun when I got there and I saw the sun when I left. You know, and it, it drizzled. There's always this fine drizzle. You'd hang up your clothes to dry, they'd be wetter. And Prabhupada said, he said, it says in the Vedas that a place where the sun does not shine is a condemned place. <laughs> so in this lecture, Srila Prabhupada also told, at least it was the first time we had heard it, the story of Dhruva Maharaj. And Srila Prabhupada was explaining how, because of Dhruva Maharaj's strong determination, his Dhritabrata, his vow, that he would, you know, realize God and that he was so determined nothing could shake him from that faith. And therefore he did. He saw God personally. And Prabhupada said right there, he said, and similarly, you can also see God in six months' time. <laughs> if you simply become this sincere and determined, and Srila Prabhupada explained how it is sincerity, that is the qualification for realizing Krishna fully. And often when Prabhupada would talk about his spiritual master, he would start to cry. And one time on Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's appearance day, I watched Prabhupada do Arti, and you really felt he was offering it to a spiritual master. You could just feel he was really offering it. There was something about just the way he he stood or the way he moved his arms, but you could really see he really meant it that he was offering this to his spiritual master. In 1976, that same year, um, Bhaktivilas Tirtha Maharaj, God brother Srila Prabhupada from the Chaitanya Mat, passed away. Prabhupada heard the news when he was in Vrindavan. 
several devotees were in his rooms at the time when we got the news. So then Prabhupada said, Ah, oh, Bhakti Vilas Tirsa. Now he is gone. But he has gone back to Godhead. So Prabhupada was very surprised. He said, But Srila Prabhupada, how is that possible? He gave you so much trouble. He never helped you. He created that whole dispute that forced a lawsuit for 40 years in the Gaudiya Mat and split up Bhakti Siddhanta's mission. How can you say that he went back to Godhead? I don't understand. And Prabhupada said, he went back to Godhead because my Guru Maharaj accepted his service. And from that, I understood that if we please the Guru and he accepts our service, then even though we may not be qualified, then Krishna, because we've pleased the pure devotee, will give us that opportunity to go back home, back to Godhead. And because Bhakti Vilas Tirtha, you know, he, he made whatever good he did, that Bhakti Siddhanta accepted his service, there was also many things that were causing a great disturbance, both through the Gaudiya Mat, and he wouldn't, didn't help Prabhupada at all, and Prabhupada requested his help on many occasions. So this is a very important lesson, I thought, you know. We really have to please the Guru and that he accepts our service. So I was typing a list of devotee names and their karmi names. And Prabhupada told me also to type that we should refer to the devotees as Prabhu, and I put that on there. And Prabhupada said, when you get to the end, leave some space at the bottom of the page. So I came to the end, and I said to Prabhupada, I'm finished. And he said, did you leave some space at the bottom of the page? And Prabhupada said, yes. And Prabhupada said, now type this. And he dictated, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Tinamini. And I offer my respectful obeisances unto Bhakti Vedanta Swami, who is very dear to Krishna on this earth, having taken shelter at his lotus feet. And I was, you know, I had never heard this before. This was the first time. And I was amazed that he could dictate obeisances to himself without being embarrassed or proud or anything, you know. It was as if he'd said, you know, get the pound of carrots and two pounds of rice, you know. I remember one time in San Francisco, this is a, a famous pastime, the Srila Prabhupada, and Prabhupada was being interviewed by a reporter, and the reporter kept asking Srila Prabhupada, when did you realize God? And Srila Prabhupada would explain in more general terms, because Srila Prabhupada always would try to defer attention from him. You know, he always wanted to glorify Krishna and glorify his spiritual master. Mm -hmm. But this guy was very persistent. Mm -hmm. And he kept, but no, but Swamiji, I want to know when you did. You know, Prabhupada would explain to him how you can also, and by chanting Hare Krishna, you can realize. So then he kept, no, but what year, how old were you when you first actually realized God? And Srila Prabhupada said, when I was five years old. And of course, Srila Prabhupada talks about that in the Bhagavatam. Also, when he talks about some of his pastimes when he was just five years old, and he, he says, he talks about Maharaj Pariksit, and a person who exhibits these kind of pastimes, that's a symptom of being God conscious as a child. So Srila Prabhupada has always been God conscious. And he came into this world God conscious. He left this world God-conscious, and he's undoubtedly now giving God-consciousness to others on another planet. And hopefully we all can be with him eternally and somehow serve him in his mission. Mm -hmm.